Hi, my name is Kayla and I'm from New Zealand. I'm a Kiwi gal. <laughs> this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and does not replace your own financial, tax, legal or financial product advice. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Ruhi and I'll be reading the land acknowledgement today. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live, the Bunurong, Bunwurung and Wurundjeri Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, also known as Melbourne, Australia, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all born and joining in from today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It was and always will be Aboriginal land. Have you ever wondered what the point is of owning a home? Well, I have as well, and that's the basic shelter that I need in my life. Now, tonight, we're going to talk about that and lots more. John, welcome to Melbourne and welcome to My Millennial Money Live. Pleasure to be at the sporting capital of the world. Well, there it is. So that's right, we're in Melbourne, we're having a great time. There's about 180 people in this room. We're going to answer their questions, we're going to have some fun. There's a couple of uh, pissed Kiwis on the front row. (laughs) And we can't do these live events without ING and BPAY and we'll share a little bit more about them later in the show but before we get into it we can't do these podcasts without our Tuesday show partner Tao Tao launched its first innovative reconciliation action plan RAP this financial year which provides the framework for how Tao will support reconciliation in the community that's Tao T-A-L ensuring this Australian life The RAP provides TAL with clear, meaningful actions to help further reconciliation. It sets out their commitments in the areas of relationships, respect, opportunities and governance. As part of their commitment to respect, last year TAL has created Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural protocols to provide TAL people with an understanding of some of the important ways they can observe on their path to reconciliation. For more information, please check the link in the show notes. And just a shout out, thanks Tao for getting behind financial literacy in Australia. It's really great to have you partnering with my millennial money. All right, John, you ready to have a chat? I am indeed. All right, let's do it. All righty then, Madeline Clare. Thanks for coming back to Melbourne this year. What would you like to talk about? At what point is the stress of owning a home and renting it out not worth the financial gain? Ooh. Is anyone here a landlord or landlady? Yep. Has anyone here wanted to drive across town and tell their tenant to politely pull their head in? Yeah. You got a great tenant. Yeah. Okay, that's some material information. Mm. John. Matty. Is it worth it being an investor, property investor? Well, it is if you're making a truckload of money. So I look at... (laughs) uh, What's the definition of truckload? No. Well, I look at it and say, well, how many hours are we spending on our passive income business, which is our investment portfolio, to make X amount of money? So if I've got a bad tenant or um, interest rates rising or, or something that's going beyond my control, I look at it and say, well, okay, what is been the performance of that property over the 12 month period and if it's gone up 50 grand and it's cost me 10 hours of my time has it been worth it it's gone up about 300,000 over the past two years right um so i would say i'd be prepared to go through a bit of hurt (laughs) it's more the financial stress on us financial Um, stress you've made 300 grand (laughs) but that's inequity like, that's not cash in our back pocket. Correct. That's, um, so we've got, we've had to do some renovations and stuff, which hasn't uh, affected our yes. um, cash in our back pocket to pay the mortgage. Mm. Um, I'm the only income earner at the moment. So my partner is studying full time. Okay. So we're asset rich, cash poor. Yes. Right. So, yeah, that's a different conversation, but we've got to look at the bigger picture and say, well, how can we change that outcome? Can we create more income in our life? Can we create more income in the property? 
Um, and if the answer to that is no and it still give me a heap of stress, then we take that cash and run. Okay. Does anyone want a four bedroom house in Hastings? <laughs> <laughs> but before you go and before you go and sell your soul, make sure that you are hundred percent clear that there's no other exit because if that's performed three hundred K in the last two years there's a good chance that it's a good performer long term. Now, I don't think that'll continue. You, you're not going to get 300K every two years. But even if it does 30K each year and it costs you 5K for your hassles, is it worth it? Okay, question. Question to Maddie. Do you guys get a big tax return at the end of the year? Combined, it's about 10,000. So you could talk with your accountant and do a withholding alteration and cash flow that extra $200 a week that might help with the week-on-week -week pressure. Um, chat with your accountant. If, if there is financial pressure and you're feeling it each week, better instead of getting a 10 grand refund at the end, end of the year, is $200 a week going to alleviate that pressure? Mm. And the answer might be no or yes, but... I think uh, it's a good philosophical chat to have regarding property. Yeah, we've got to exhaust all avenues because I don't. I rarely get people come to me to say, I should have sold that property sooner. Now think about that for a moment. Like I should have sold that property 10 years ago because in the last 10 years it's probably doubled, yeah. right? I get more of I should have held on to that property. Mm. Yeah. What would the matty of 10 years in the future, want you to do? Depends. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Give her a hand, everyone. It's good we've got good sports. Come on, Jeremy. Jeremy, you probably don't remember. I remember. Hey, nice to meet you, Glenn. All right, Jeremy, what's your question tonight? Um, I suppose, at what point is the cost of LMI too high and saving for a larger deposit the better option? Hmm, the crowd goes wild. Um, how much is the LMI? Oh, it's a... Depends. It's a bit. It could be a bit. So you made up a question for me to try and answer. No, like, oh, okay, so it could be anywhere between 20 and 30. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's getting up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, maybe it's, 40. Maybe 40. <laughs> yeah, that's getting up there. Oof. I wouldn't be doing more than 15 grand myself. Yeah. No, look, we've got to look at the opportunity cost, but we've also got to look at... The, the positives for all right. Let me go back a step. If it's for an investment, it's more feasible because you can capitalise in, into your loan and you can claim it on your tax because it's an income producing asset. If it's a principal place of residence, I'd say no, don't do it. However, if it's going to take you another five years to save another ten percent, then you've got to look at that opportunity cost, don't you? But Within reason, like, <laughs> like, what's the purchase price you're looking for? Anywhere between, I suppose, eight hundred to one ish. And it's yeah. your own home. Yeah. Do you have a deposit? A bit, yeah. Yeah, okay. but like not twenty percent. All right. Yeah. So, can you get up to ten percent? Yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. Can you go? Because LMI, believe it or not, is the bank wakes up and says, "This is how much I'm going to charge you." You go to them in two months' time and it's a different figure. So you've got to play that game a little bit. But also think about, well, I buy a million-dollar property. If that's my dream home and I'm holding it for 20 years and it goes up 5% in the first year, that's 50 grand. You've paid 20 grand in LMI. Yes, that hurt. That's added 20 grand to your loan. However, I'm 30K in front versus waiting another two or three years where that $1 million property might be 1.2. Can I say something? Sure. It's your show, mate. Uh, <laughs> it is. Um, have you got a good mortgage broker? Uh, like we've sort of just started looking into it. Yeah. Because if you don't, like chat with James and his team because you need to get real data based on your dis your own situation. So then the real data is on the table and we know one lender might charge 31,000 LMI, the next lender might charge 18,000. So you really just need to get some good options and then make an on-balance judgment call. But I will say, Pidge, like your, it's come up in this question and the last one, 
it is a bit of a mindset risk profile question about the on paper growth versus the feeling of cash flow. Mm. And you're a seasoned investor, so you're like, oh, yeah, I'll throw 20 grand in to make 300 grand, but it still feels like I've just had to spend $20,000. Totally. And it is mindset, you're right. But you look at 20 grand as a repayment on addition to what your mortgage would be, mm. and it's chicken feed, isn't it? Yeah. So basically, what we're saying is because it's on a rock, the LMI component is dead money. Yeah, to an extent, yeah. To the extent of, well, if it's 20K, you're going to be paying that off for the next 30 years, capitalised into your loan. However, the opportunity cost will be wondering. Yeah, that, right. I suppose that's the question, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> and, and I always put myself in, the, in your shoes. What would I do at that time? And I'm personally saying... I'm getting into that million dollar home because that's going to give me much better results than the, the 20K LMI that's costing me. Yes, it hurts. Could I avoid it? Can I go to another lender? I would explore all options before I have to capitalise that 20K. Um, this isn't financial advice, but this is what I'm doing. Does that help? Yeah, it's good. And, and I think as well, like the whole lifestyle thing, like if you've been sick of getting evicted and kicked out and moving and... I've been renting for five years. I'm over this. I can serve it as a million dollars debt with an extra 30 grand of LMI. I'm buying the bastard and moving on with my life. And so it, there's so many layers that you just have to have all the data on the table and make an on balance call. And maybe in your column, you might have lifestyle pros and cons and financial pros and cons and make an on balance between the two of them. Let's put it to the crowd. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're paying 25 grand LMI to get into the property sooner, yeah? 25, 30 grand, whatever we're doing? It depends on the property, which is a lifestyle yeah. consideration. So I'm, a, I'm assuming, Half David, the room. I'm assuming that it's Jeremy's home that he wants for the next 20 years. Anyway, Jeremy, flip a coin, 50-50. Do what you want. I don't care. Just ask the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Phone a friend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, give There's me a, a hand, everyone. In the back here. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Well done, Jeremy. Far out. Uh, Janice, hi. Firstly, it's Janice. Hello, Janice. everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Is it oh spelled my... the same? It's spelled exactly the same. And <laughs> so, apologies. <laughs> Accepted. <laughs> Um, okay, firstly, well, let's before bring, we yeah, start, okay, yeah. this isn't my question. This is one of my mate's questions for right. me because she thinks this is really important for me. Okay. I'm going to get... John's just like read the question. He's like, I'm out. See ya. Um, all right. See you, John. See ya. Nice to see ya. <laughs> Who wants to answer a random money question with me? You don't know the question. Come on. Is it Lucy? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Lucy. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So this question... Lucy's a professional what? A professional finance intern. She's General a advice. This is not suited to your wow, personal Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, okay. <laughs> More knowledge than I have, so <laughs> correct. Okay, so Janice, you've got a question that a friend asks you to ask. Yeah, let's put it that way. Sure. Can you read this question? Sure. All right. Change my mind. I don't think I need to put any extra money in super. Now... I'm going to add an extra bit, two things. One, why deny myself gratification today when I might not reach retirement age? <laughs> two, I've supported many older people in my life. My experience has been up until about the age of 75, 76, they spend money like there's no tomorrow and then it stops. All right, should I put extra money in my super? Go, Lucy. So what I'm thinking is, coming from a 21-year-old who we should all be taking advice from. <laughs> Hell yeah. I think if you, if you look, we're looking on balance, if you think you're investing enough for the future, you're salary sacrificing enough for the future, you still need enough to live right now because personally... I'm not a woman of religion because I think what's the point in living my life a certain way now so that when I die, I can have joy. I'd rather have the joy right now. So I think have the joy now, invest a little bit for the future 
and make sure you're still keeping a healthy balance. Life is all about moderation. So moderately invest into super and moderately live your life. All right, preach this stuff. I've noticed Glenn's <laughs> gone to the book. He so, has. Sorry, Glenn. Come the on. good book. <laughs> <laughs> and just so it's like funny, Nath, edit that out so the people listening don't think I'm reading out of a book. <laughs> No, no, I'll give you money okay. if you don't. Okay, all right. How much? Um. <laughs> all right, I know, we're ready? Going, okay. going right, people? Page, page 286 of the book. I like to, that question, one, don't care what your friend does. Uh, thanks, Sims. <laughs> yep, don't care. Secondly, I like to reverse engineer that question. When wouldn't I put money into super? I'm saving for my first home, that's more important, excluding the first home super saver scheme. I'm trying to get out of consumer debt, need to do that. I'm trying to save for an, a loan for an investment property because I want to rent in the city and invest with the property outside because I love property and I'm a property freak. <laughs> I've got to save for my kid's education and I'll need that money in 12 years. I want to save and start a business. I've got some other lifestyle and financial goals. I want to go to Italy for six months. So all those things are things that are happening in our life outside of super that are probably more pressing than worrying about the future. So I think it is more a question why wouldn't you and write down reasons why you wouldn't and then write down reasons why you would. Because we all have a thing in our financial life. We get to a critical mass. You've started your career, you've got out of debt because you made some mistakes, you've got your emergency fund, I've got my home or my living and I'm, I'm established. I think once you're established, whatever that looks like in your world, then it's a broader discussion of I've done my budget, I've done my spending plan and I've legitimately got money left over in my life that has to go to work for future me. Now, future me could be in 15 years, future me could be in 60 and 70 years. So you don't have to put all your money in super, you can put a little bit in super. I would also say if you've got insurance, death cover, TBD cover that's inside super, as a minimum, if you salary sacrifice that premium into super to cover the insurances, at least all your insurances are basically tax deductible and your super fund isn't going behind. So the answer is, it depends. All right. I, I, I'm actually going to take over here and ask the crowd. That's an answer I'm really comfortable with. What do other people think? Okay, who's putting more money in... Okay, wait, let, keep your hand. Who currently adds more money into super right now than their employee contribution? Look <gasps> at that. You guys are crazy. No, it's awesome. But, uh, <laughs> because it, it is exactly... I agree with everyone. It's one eye on the future, one eye on now. Yeah, Jess said mention loot. It's about living life on your own terms. So that means I want to work three days a week and live my life and have value and chill for the other two. Well, do that, but just make sure you're not in credit card debt. Just make sure you're living within your means. But I would say while we finish, because we've got to move on, if you make the decision to spend all your money on all the fun stuff, okay? When you're at age 60 and you don't have extra in super, just your 10%, don't whinge and don't be a victim because you have made that choice. Anyone here, put your hand up. If you're under, I'll be nice, don't put your hand up. Put your hand up in your heart. <laughs> if you're under 45 or under 50, put your hand up. Yep, it, I said in your heart. <laughs> you have got no excuse whatsoever because you're about to hear me say this. The age pension is not something I want you to aspire to. It's a safety net for the most vulnerable. You are responsible for your own financial future. If you don't want to save extra money for future you, that's okay, but don't whinge. We're all adults and we all make decisions. <sighs> Got heavy. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. Not a woman of religion till it comes to you, Glenn. Yes. Thank you, Janice.
Okay, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back right after this. I really want to thank ING and BPAY for getting behind our national tour. We honestly could not do it without them. If you're thinking about refinancing your home loan, ING could save you a heap. Search ING Loans, subject to credit approval and TNCs. ING Bank Australia Limited, Australian Credit Licence 229823. To stay in control of your bill payments, use BPAY. With BPAY, you can pay your bills from the security of your online banking, choose which account to pay the bills, and even schedule payments for a time that suits you better. Say, after payday. Scheduled payments are subject to systems and funds availability. BPAY, see the PDS for further information. If you're after personal financial advice, don't get it from a podcast. If you would like help based on your own personal situation, head over to sortyourmoneyout.com. Click get help and we'd be happy to introduce you to one of our trusted advisors. Our panel of advisors, mortgage brokers and accountants work with clients all over Australia so they can connect with you wherever you are. That's sortyourmoneyout.com and click get help. Okay, we're back. Now... What I'm going to do, I'm going to ask Simran Kaur from New Zealand, host of the Girls That Invest podcast, author of the book Girls That Invest, international speaker. She's been in Vogue. She's been in the Auckland Gazette. What hasn't she been in? She's doing her international book tour and we're going to give some books of hers away tonight. I've been buying them from all different bookshops all around Australia and giving them away because I want to support you and get the word out. But Sim, I want to ask you about your life, but I want Henry to ask his question. Come up, Henry. Um, I just got some questions like how to start a side hustle. Um, would I want to use my own money, my wife's and our savings to start that or use the bank's money and just start it that way? Awesome. And I wanted to position that question. Sim, two years ago, you didn't have Girls That Invest podcast. No, not at all. You didn't have an international book that's been, like it's in freaking Barnes and Noble in America. Like, who is this? So good, right? Your Instagram, there's like 170,000 followers on it and it started from one follower and it was a side hustle. So can you explain to Henry, sorry, I keep thinking Harry Potter. (laughs) Can you please explain to Henry how you started your side hustle and what you were doing before you started Girls That Invest? It's such a good question because with my friends, I'm, I'm the side hustle friend. I'm the one that's like, you should turn that into a side hustle, which is probably not the best kind of friend to have in your life. But with Girls That Invest, it started off as a hobby. It started off as a side hustle. March 2020 hit. Everyone kind of went home from work and didn't come back for a little while. And that was me as well. So I was not in finance to begin with. I was an optometrist completely separate field. And when it comes to side hustles, I had done quite a few in my life prior to that, you know, in in university and in high school. And what I learned was that if you enjoy the side hustle, you're probably going to stick it through. I'd done so many before. I did a side hustle where I was selling sunglasses online because I was like, no one's selling cheap sunglasses online. And it was doing so well, but I didn't care about it. You know, I wasn't someone that was into fashion and so very quickly I got bored and so it didn't, you know, amount to as much. And so when I found something that was scalable and enjoyable, that was something I could continue to do even if it wasn't generating anything because it was a passion project as opposed to something to make money and that really helped. And so, you know, our story was that we, my best friend and I thought, let's just start a podcast for a year, see what happens. If at most we might help one person, otherwise we might learn a couple of things ourselves. And that's what it took for us to do it. In terms of using your money or the bank's money, I like to use my own money to begin with. I just find that if I do it that way, I'm going to be more stingy with it. I'm going to be more creative with it. And I'm going to try and make it, you know, last as long as possible. Whereas if I have a loan or if I get extra money um, from other places, you kind of live a different lifestyle and it might not, you know, go as far. Yeah. And I've shared the story once where I, when I started my business, I 
did an advertisement in a local real estate thing and at the time it was $1,000 for six months in this brochure thing and it should have been 100 grand because I didn't have the money anyway. (laughs) And so I spent that $1,000 and I never, ever got a phone call or a client. Two years later, I was going through my Dropbox looking at old archives of, oh, that was cute when I first started and my logos and all that. Oh, wrong phone number. And it just slipped. So the point is, if I got a $20,000 personal loan and deployed $5,000 for that ad to make it go further, my losses would have been magnified. But if I struck the gold, my uh, income would have been magnified on the other side. But when we're starting the side hustle, I don't believe we should be taking those risks because you have to go slow and organic Because if I did spend $5,000 of the bank's money and it did blow up and I didn't have my systems and processes in place, I probably wouldn't have been ready to take on all those extra clients and they would have had a bad experience anyway. So I think with side hustles, it is slow, steady and on the side. And Sim, at what point, because you're now not doing optometry, at what point and what was the discussions, the thoughts for you to go... I quit, see you later, and then make that jump because there is a risk step. So what was your story, Sim? Well, my leap, I guess, came from almost just realising that, you know, after a while, you can only spend so much time doing two things poorly or doing one thing really well. And I'm, I'm not, I like to think I take a lot of risk, but realistically, I don't. And so it got to a point where I thought, okay, this is making enough money, I could have enough to at least cover my mortgage. That was my main thing. I had a home. I was the only person on it. So I needed to make sure that I could cover my mortgage for at least six months. And once I could do that with the side hustle and I'd put that away, I think that's when I thought I could probably let my job go. I think it was also a little bit of gentle bullying from Glenn to leave and just being like, why do you still work there? (laughs) He was like, are you still treating glaucoma? How's that going for you? (laughs) I actually said that. (laughs) Hey, I'm real. Don't you know it? I would go to work and I'd think about that comment. <laughs> real. But, but yeah, so a, a lot of that, and it's always hard because I loved my old job. So it's not a case of, you know, I was trying to, I was being pushed out the door. I wanted to get out. I think it's, you, you find what you're comfortable with and other people might tell you to leave earlier, but I think it's when you're ready. Yeah. Awesome. So I hope that helps. Um, I'll be hanging around at the end if you want to just chat a bit more, but uh We'll move on to the next question and thank you, Sim. We might have Amber come up. Uh, Amber Bock, do you want to come down? And I might get Shell to jump up as well. Uh, Shell is the host of the My Millennial Career podcast. Do you remember that question? Uh-huh. How can I be more intentional with my earnings from my second job so I don't burn out accepting slash getting too much work? Awesome. Okay. Let's just ask a couple of questions. What's your current job and what's your second job? Um, I'm a teacher and my second job, I'm a personal trainer. Wow. Awesome. So I want to attack this from two angles because I know Sim, myself and Shell have had issues when we feel like we're hitting the wall. How did you manage that, Sim, when you were doing the GTI on the side? Do you call it GTI? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um how, how, how did you manage? How did I manage? And to be more intentional with the earnings as well. It's such a good question, but I think it comes down to, you know, if you feel like you're getting so much work, why not hire someone to work with you and take on your work as well? Like I don't, you don't have to do it all, you know? What do you want to do if in five years time, if you only did one thing, what would it be? Oh, um, it would actually be working in the arts. So ditching personal training, ditching um, teaching and working in the creative arts. So in what field, like music, actual paint or I don't know. (laughs) No, I'm a bogan. No, no, it's okay. It's wide, it's wide. Um, I love live theatre and I love um, managing artists. And so I used to work as a stage manager. So that's what I used to do before personal training, before teaching. Um, Yeah, so like managing artists basically. Awesome. Okay, Shell, (laughs) lots going on there. Lots going on. How would you treat that? Um, Amber, I think the really important thing to remember is 
your career is a long game. And so one of the challenges that we have, especially at the moment where we're trying to make as much money as we can, and it's a tricky financial climate right now. And so we're trying to make that money. But the risk I see and have seen with a lot of people is, well, we, we really max out our time. We go, well, I just have to work 60 whatever hours a week to get to this income level. And we don't remember that, hey, we're going to be working for, what, 50 years? Is that how long? It's really depressing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so thinking that through and going, well, what is a sustainable level of of performance over the long term? And when I hear you say, well, eventually I'd like to get into the creative arts space and manage artists or that side of things, what I'd be saying to you is, well, how are you going to find the time right now to start to dip your toe in the water? Because it can take a while to transition. So if you've got a little thing in you that's like – oh, one day I'd love to try this, like what Amber has of of the creative arts space. You need to give yourself space to do that. You can't just like max out of PT, uh, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you, but PT and teaching and then think, oh, eventually I'll get to that because it could take you three to five years to make a transition like that. So what I want you to do is evaluate, do I need this income desperately right now? If you do, keep doing what you're doing. But if not, and you're like only doing it to fill in time, then what I'd be saying is step back from the PT role or whatever's less and start to find opportunities to put your toe in the water with a creative arts space because that's the long game and that's what you do to avoid burnout as well. Yeah. Who here has felt on the edge of burnout? Yeah. Who who here is is in burnout? (laughs) (laughs) Who here is recovering from burnout? (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Is your financial situation without telling everyone your tax file number, like, <laughs> are you, like, are you healthy financially or? Oh, I would say that my partner and I are like 12 months away from buying a house. Yeah, our first house. Yeah, sweet. So, again, I don't know all your story and I would love to, maybe we can do a, if you want one day, we'll do a deep dive episode on this because there's a lot of factors here. My 10 second response would be grind away with the side hustle. Is your partner here? Hey, bro. Um, I would absolutely grind away in the next 12 months, get in that first home, make sure that you can live in that first home without the second income, then do what Shell does, so ditch the side hustle that's there. Because we should only do side hustles that I believe for four reasons. Number one, get out of debt, credit cards, personal loans, all that. Second reason, uh, a short-term goal. Third reason, have a side hustle that you want to do that full time. Or the fourth reason, I just like it and it's not about the money and it's about the value and all that. So what I would say with the side hustle for PT, yes, you don't mind it. Yes, it's money towards the goal. Get in the house, have a breather, then have your side hustle, quote unquote, as, you know, and COVID's ending and the theatre industry is coming back, then you can transition from side hustle from a a goal to side hustle that I want to do this longer term and then I can build up money and then take that risk and quit teaching and then do theatre full time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. No worries. Give her a hand, everyone. Thanks, Shell. How have you managed burnout? How have I managed burnout? Yeah. I think the first time I ever experienced my whole life... The last couple of years, a lot of people were like, watch out for burnout, take care of yourself, you know? And I was like, that's for losers. Like, that's not something that I need to worry (laughs) about. Um, I I had a very um, strong view on it and I didn't understand what burnout was. I just thought, like, I enjoy my work. I enjoy my side hustles. I'd go home at five o'clock and I'd have energy to do the side hustles. So I thought there's nothing wrong with that. I'll keep going. Um, And then I hit burnout and I still remember it. I was in, I was writing my book. I was in Queenstown. It's this beautiful place, you know, down the bottom of New Zealand. I felt like I was in paradise. And I got just one more email and I just burst out crying. I was like, one more email. I can't do it. And that's when I realised burnout isn't just feeling like you can't do things. It's almost like almost like a depressive episode in your life. And you just, you feel so lethargic, you have fatigue. And what was the question again? I don't know. <laughs> How did you manage? How cried. Did I, manage? I just cried. 
I cried it out. How did I manage it? I think that's when I realized, you know, you have to take care of yourself and you can't kind of wait till the end. It's not a ambulance at the bottom of the hill kind of situation where when you hit burnout, you take care of yourself. It's like having boundaries and saying no to things and putting yourself first. And clearly those aren't things that I used to value, but that's what I've been trying to do and it's been working well. Yeah, awesome. Okay, Brooke, do you want to read this question here that you've submitted? Um, so my question is, what's the biggest financial lesson you've learned? Oh, that's a good Ooh, one. Grab a seat. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we're going to end on this, but what I'm going to do, we're going to get Nathan and me with the roving mics and we're going to run around the room. So if you want to think about the biggest financial lesson that you've had, keep your hands raised. I don't want 15 minutes of comment. <laughs> I know some of you, um, and we'll we'll capture a heap of these, and then we might wrap it up and play. Okay, Sim, what's the biggest financial lesson that you have learned? That debt isn't always bad. Ooh, have you got an example? Um, I used, I just used to think having any kind of debt was bad. You just needed to get rid of it. But a mortgage isn't necessarily a bad thing. A student loan isn't a bad thing. Yeah, awesome. My biggest uh, financial lesson I've ever learned is. Um, that behaviour trumps logic and the world and the money world is grey, it's not black and white and I have to automate my savings and my spending. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Next qu- next comment. Hey, Glenn. Hey. Uh, biggest financial lesson I've ever learned is 18-year-old boys shouldn't get credit cards. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> next. Go for it. Just pass that mic around. It's a hot potato. Um, your mindset of money can be passed down through generations, so from your parents. So it's really important to recognise and unlearn some of the unhealthy habits. Cool. Uh, and just say your name first if you would like. Hello. Hi, I'm Emily. Uh, need versus want. So if you need it, get it. If you want it, think about it. Oh, that's good. Can we meme that or something? <laughs> Um, it's Calvin. My lesson is um, um, ETF over active investing and no cryptos. Ooh. <laughs> Wild. Who we got? Yep, in the middle. Uh, I'm Vaish. Um, my lesson is having an emergency fund actually opens up a world of opportunity because of the sense of security it buys. Hi, it's Yumi. Um, I was going to say a similar thing um, about it. I was going to say mindset behind the work is important and just work smart and that's it. Awesome. Kate's right next to you. She's got a... What I was going to say is that rather than focusing on the amount of money you're going to make, what you would like to do and how you use the money from what you would like to do to fund your future lifestyle. Yeah, awesome. Josh. Hi, I'm Josh. Probably a simple one. Don't compare yourself to people in the same, you know, field, area, whatever. Everyone's goals are different. So don't sit there and think that, you know, if you're getting started on something that somehow you're a failure behind, you're at a different step in your life to someone else and that is totally okay. Awesome. So. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I was looking at my watch uh, and it wasn't because of you. Oh. <laughs> that's true. No, Jake. <laughs> Josh is awesome. Anyone here want the magic mic? <laughs> Sasha. <laughs> I'm having fun. Um, I'm Sasha. And my financial lesson would be that you don't need to be a millionaire to invest. Awesome. Anyone over here want to... Oh, James Miller. It's efficient funds. Hey, I'm James. So save mercilessly on the things you don't care about so you can spend like crazy on the things you do. Oh, okay, Gandhi. (laughs) Phil Thompson, Sky Wealth. Okay, my life lesson about money is do what you're passionate about. Don't just say, I really want to achieve this, unless you're going to actively try and achieve it. Awesome. There's a lady here who I think is a champion, Joe Zuli. Uh, what's your biggest lesson that you've learned? Okay, well, I'm not a millennial, as you can probably see. I've got four, four children, <laughs> uh, one, one who I've dragged along with me tonight. Um, and it's, the, it's never too early to start and often you think you don't have enough to put it put aside, um, but it's never too early to start. Awesome. Lockie, what have you learned from mum? <laughs> uh, I'm Lockie. I'm Joe's middle child. Um, my mum is really great and she taught me a lot of things, but 
I've never got a credit card and that's something that mum taught me and I'm, yeah, I'm never going to get one, I think. Yeah, awesome. Got Louise here. Awesome. Nathan, up the back. I'll continue with parental wisdom right from my old man. He always said, it's just money, the banks are full of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. My name is Saeed um, and my biggest um, money lesson is probably uh, just, I remember someone once told me, and it, this is a, you know, a, a, a very common quote, uh, your network is your, ne- your net worth. And for me, over the years, I think that's something that I started to believe because, you know, even just being here today, you, you never know who might put you on onto your next opportunity. So for me, I think that's probably my biggest lesson. And just on that, just share a little bit about your story over the last couple of years because I wanted to get you up here for the episode. So I appreciate it. Um, so for me... Um, I, I came across this podcast because uh, I remember in 2019, I used to drive, you know, a fairly long way from work to home and I was looking for something to keep my mind occupied. And, uh, you know, I've been following this podcast since 2019 and, you know, I've implemented some of the things that, you know, Glenn's talked about in his, uh, in, in, his in this particular podcast. And uh, today I brought my friend along, so... Um, yeah, it's made a lot of differences in my life. So, yeah, thank you very much. No, that's all right. Thank you for the ego boost. <laughs> no, I, I just really appreciate you uh, being a long-term listener and if you are a long-term listener of the show, thanks for putting up with us and hopefully you outgrow what we talk about and you just tune in for encouragement uh, because a lot of you have thanked me and John and the team for helping but we just pointed you in the right direction you did it all and that's what we're here for so we're going to wrap it up sim tell us where we can learn more about girls that invest um the book's over there if you would like to purchase one (laughs) (laughs) who who hasn't bought a book yet yeah okay and keep your hand up if you've got a full-time job yep so you can afford it (laughs) All right. Thank you so much, Sim, for joining us in Melbourne. Give her a hand, everyone. I would like to also thank ING and BPay for getting behind the podcast live tour. I'd like to thank our show partner, Tao, and the team from Tao. Thanks so much for coming along tonight. Melbourne, you've been real. I've been Glenn, and this is My Millennial Money. Thank you so much. Give yourselves a hand. We acknowledge the Awabakal people, traditional custodians of the land on which our studio sits, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may listen to our podcast. My Millennial Money supports a variety of charities, and we encourage you to consider giving as part of your overall financial strategy. If you would like some giving options, or if you're unsure about which charity you can support, head to mymillennial.money forward slash charities for more info. This podcast is for education and entertainment purposes. Any advice is general financial advice only, which does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Because of that, you should consider if the advice is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on the information. If you do choose to buy a financial product, read the product disclosure statement, target market determination, and obtain appropriate financial advice tailored to your needs. Simo Interactive Proprietary Limited, the publisher of the podcast, and Glenn James are authorized representatives of Money Sherpa Proprietary Limited, which holds financial services license 451289.